have to roll this one. You can begin. I arrived in Gary, Indiana, February the 20th, 19 and 20, about 2 o'clock in the afternoon. I immediately went over to my cousin's house on 1744 Monroe Street. And uh, the next day, I, I went to the steel mill to get a job. I went in what they call the bullpen. There's about a hundred or more men there looking for work. And the manager that was, uh, the agent that was hiring people, picked me out, went over there, hey boy, I want you, come over here. And I got a job. They put me in the department, the uh, blast furnace department. And I worked about three or four days there and I couldn't stand the gas. And I quit that job. And I didn't like it to begin with because it was a 12-hour 12 12 hour day. So in uh, a couple of days later, I went to, to the tin mill. I got a job in a tin mill. And uh, they gave me, uh, they, the manager said, you look like you'd like make a good tin house worker. And they put me in the tin house. And I uh, learned how to operate a tinning machine. And uh, uh, a tinning machine, a machine that had hot metal and oil, and you'd run very thin sheets of steel through that tin metal and come out uh, in sheets. And uh, I liked the job, and I stayed on that for 17 years. Now, this job in the mill. Sorry, can I cut this again? Okay, we have to stop for just a second. The job that I went on uh, as a tin operator, running sheets of tin through hot metal, it was a dirty job with gas and oil and acid, and I had to fire my own furnace to keep the metal hot and to go to the basement for that, and it was a really rough, hard job. But I was tough enough, and it didn't bother me at all. And uh, I liked it because it was piece work, and an eight-hour day, which was something that I wanted, and I didn't want to, uh, a job where I had to work 12 hours, and I was fortunate in getting a job that I only had to work eight hours. And my salary was run from anywhere from five to eight, and once in a while I'd make nine dollars a day. That was very good money over the basic wage of three dollars and forty-nine cents a day for labor. Now, when we talked on the telephone, you told me that that the black people, they would steer black people into certain jobs, the harder jobs, the more dangerous jobs. Can you tell me that story again? Well, I think it was just about the same. Uh, of course there were dangers there. The dangers was because you had metal and water. And now if that water got in contact with the hot metal, it would splash. And uh, there were white workers in the department. The only discrimination at the time I went on, uh, got a job, was the fact that there were no uh, black uh, uh, mechanics, machinists. And but after a year or so, they began to put them on. We didn't have too many problems. The only problem, big problem we had was uh, the wage cuts. Every, it looked like every week or so they'd cut our wages back. And we began to protest. With, and I took the lead in setting up a tin house club. And uh, we protested against the company. And we set, had to shut down for a few hours. Okay. Now, that's good. Tell me about uh, your experience with the Amalgamated and how you joined, and what you did as an organizer. The old Amalgamated Iron, Steel, and Tin Workers Union made an effort to organize when they heard about the CIO coming on the scene. And there was an electrician that was a very nice sort of a fellow, and uh, somebody told him that uh, 
that uh, I had uh, gotten a group of workers together protesting the cuts. And so he contacted me. He says, well, we need a union here. And gave me some cards, and I started writing up. And I think I wrote up about 14 of the fellows that I've been working with. And uh, it wasn't too long then. The CIO, the Steel Workers Organizing Committee, came on the scene, and I went to join them. Now, why did you leave the Amalgamated and go with the CIO? Because it was better. Tell me Those how. Amalgamated hadn't done anything for blacks, and I knew it. Okay, wait a minute. You have to tell me that again because I messed up. I was talking, okay? So you have to tell me that again, that the old Amalgamated, tell me that again. Now I have to be quiet. About the old Amalgamated, uh, I never did attend any of their meetings. All the cards that I wrote up, I turned them over to the electrician. And I was just, wasn't satisfied with that union because of its discrimination tactics. I knew about it. And uh, I, I knew uh, any kind of union was better than no union. Now, when we talked before, you told me a story about a friend who was a carpenter who signed you up. And you told me a story about Hank Johnson with the CIO. Signed me up? Yeah. Uh, how I got signed up? Uh, one of my friends, uh, I call him a friend, by the name of Jesse Reese. Jesse Reese was, in the, was a communist, and he let the world know it. He didn't hide it. Anybody asked him, was he a communist? And he would tell you with pride that he was a communist. But we, he's a likable sort of a fellow. On Sunday afternoons, many of us uh, would go to his house and play cards. And uh, on that one Sunday afternoon... And uh, uh, Jesse Reese had been to a meeting in East Chicago. And when he got home, I was sitting in the house. He said, hey, Brother Kimley, join the union. I, I had a card here. He handed it to me. And I kept talking. I picked it up and looked at it and grabbed my name and just handed him a dollar. Just like that, easy. And lo and behold, when I found out, I, I, I think I wrote the, I was the first deal worker to join the union in Gary, Indiana. Now, why is it that you all felt like you needed a union? Why did you need a union? Why did you feel like you needed a union? Well, I had I had some experience in Detroit, Michigan. I got a job at the Abso Pure Ice Company in the storage. And in 19 and 15, there was beginning to be a shortage of labor. And they pulled me out, they didn't ask me had I ever worked in delivered ice or anything. I told them, yes, when down south I'd done some work on the ice wagon. So they put me on the wagon. And let me tell you, I had the hardest time uh, breaking in. And uh, uh, there's a word that I don't like to use, but Maybe uh, you can cut it out if you don't like it. All day long, people say, see the nigger, see the nigger? They got a nigger on the ice wagon. And I swore that rather than fight back, I'm going to overcome this thing. And I just let them have their fun. Every day was the same thing. So the, 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 the driver that I was working with, he was a mean sort of crap. The kids would jump up on the wagon to get ice, and he'd throw his thongs at them. And as soon as he'd go in one house delivering ice, I'd take a chunk of ice and cut it up and give it to the kids. And one of the kids looked at me. I said, hey, you the guy that called me that bad name. Aren't you the kid that called me out my name? Oh, no, Mr. I didn't call you out. I said, well, you take this piece of ice and run. Don't you ever call me uh, the name that you called me. You know I broke it up completely. Now, to the customers, it was against the rules to let customers have ice on credit or to uh, uh, let them have it for cash. So when Adams, the guy I was working with, would go in the house and they didn't have money to pay for the ice or, or tickets for the ice, he'd bring the ice back 
out and throw it in the wagon. And I took up a chunk and go right behind him. I could see why he'd been in the ice, but it would leave its mark. Uh -huh. And the lady would say, you know, the other fellow came in here and we didn't have the money uh, to pay him. He took the ice back. I said, well, listen, it's too hot to be living without having some ice. Uh -huh. I said, if you won't say anything about it, I'll let you have it. The ice. Good. Now, tell me why the steel workers felt like they needed a union. How much we got? Okay, we have to change. See, after you get finished with this, you're probably going to get a call from Hollywood. Now, you're going to tell me why the steel workers needed a union, why they needed the CIO. Well, there were many reasons why the steel workers needed the union. In the first place, the wages were way too low. And another reason is there was all kinds of records being built around the steel workers. They want to seem to keep them almost enslaved. Twelve hours were too many hours to work in any, any job. And uh, with low wages and uh, no vacations and and the pension fund was little or nothing, uh, twenty-five and thirty dollars a month or less, and uh, there was just need for a union. And many of the jobs was had was uh, bad uh, jobs where you were against the one sales, assets and gas and water and and all kinds of dangers and uh, people were being injured and they weren't get, being properly paid. There was a uh, hundred or thousand reasons why there was a need for a steel union. Now, what was the relationship like between the workers and the people that ran the plant? What was that relationship like? I mean, you all had these problems, and you would tell them about them, and then, so what would happen? What was that relationship like? I, I didn't say have a bad relationship with the management. Uh, before the union, uh, I got along with people. Uh, maybe I just was tough enough to understand to, to take care of the little hardships that I had to go through. Because I just got been out of the war for a year. I was discharged in February 1919, and I was still pretty tough from the war. Six months is a long time to be on a fighting front. And you can imagine what one would go up against. Mm -hmm. Okay, but what about some of the other people that you worked with that wasn't so tough? How was their relationship with the people that ran the, the mill? Well, they were just looking for somebody to lead them. And uh, I, I guess I had guts enough to do it, see? And I, well, I wasn't harsh at the company. I talked reasonable with them. And I talked with them in such a way, I said, well, as to what would you do if you were working? And I, I didn't have any problems with the management. They called me in one time, and now I'm talking with them just like we're talking. Okay. Good. Now, you had said that um, your friend Hank, Henry Reese was a communist. Yes. Now, from what I read, there was a lot of communists that were in the CIO, that they were good organizers. Can you tell me about that and their involvement? Well, yes. Let me tell you, Philip Murray would have never organized the steel workers in the Dick in Gary, Indiana, or Northwest Indiana, if they hadn't taken the communists in. The communists had their hands on the masses of people. Now, mind you, back in the early 20s, the Ku Klux Klan had just about uh, controlled Northwest Indiana. They had it almost buttoned up. And all, in fact, I almost had the state of Indiana. When I got there in February the 20th, 1920, the only meetings that black people would go to was the church. And there were two organizations that would stand up against the Ku Klux Klan, the Communist Party and the Marcus Garvey's outfit. I belonged to Marcus Garvey's outfit. I got along with the communists. Uh, they wouldn't, didn't want me in the, in the union uh, as a member because I was almost a fellow traveler. I liked the way they operated. 
The only reason that I didn't join the Communist Party is because they didn't believe in God. That's the only reason that I didn't join. I like the way they operate. They sit down and eat with you. They laugh and talk with you. You go to their meetings. You dance with you. And it made no difference, see? But uh, they had the ulterior motives in the new end. And when I was found out that they didn't believe in God, well, I just backed off them. But two or three times the communists saved me against some of my own friends who thought the best way to get on the staff was to get rid of Kimberly. And after I told them, I said, listen here, you don't have to get rid of me. You come go around with me and learn. The union is young yet. Good. Now, beyond um, the communist involvement, what were race relations like within the union? I mean, I know that there were a lot of ethnic, a lot of ethnic groups and so forth. How did all the ethnic groups and different races get along within the union? There's not but one thing that ever happened that I disapproved of, and, it, and I didn't make any protest. In one of the big local unions, and I attended. Now I'm on the staff. Now I went on the staff in September, uh, in uh, August 1937, and when I attend. They attended a meeting of 1014. They all requested that the, the black workers sit in the back. Well, that was the old mine workers' method at one time. I protested, I think, to some of the people, and from then on, I didn't just say nothing about where you sit when you attend the meeting. That's the only difference that I saw the whole time I was in the union. Now, do you remember your first union meeting that you went to? Well, that was one of them. Okay, so tell me what would happen at the union meetings, and what oh, oh. I mean, well, how, did you, how did you get in and make sure that people that weren't in the union getting in there, the spies and that kind of thing? Tell me about that. Well, I tell you what, we were in the drive to get the we were workers in the union, and uh, we'd have uh, edu what we call educational uh, meetings on the picket line. And if you didn't have your card, you couldn't get in, see. Uh, on one or two occasions, we had a problem that uh, I thought was going to get nasty. One of my friends uh, told me, he said, listen, Kimberly, uh, I'm going to get in. I'm not, I don't belong to the union. And I'm going to get in. If those, any of those SOBs try to stop me, I'm going to shoot the hell out of them. I said, now, listen, you don't have to do that, see. When you come down the line, I see you coming, I'm going to escort you through. And I did, see. But he didn't know that I had written his card up and put it in the basket as a member of the union. And when he woke up, he was already in the union, and I signed his card. <laughs> okay. Now tell me um, about how you recruited uh, John Howard to the union. You signed him up, right? Yeah, I went to his house. Me, oh, wait a minute. Now, tell me that story. I went to John L. Howard's uh, house, and uh, I heard about him being very prominent in the mill. He was well thought of. And uh, I talked a little bit about the union, not too much, because he'd already known. And I wrote him up. Didn't have any problem at all with getting John Howard in the union. You told me that uh, you were involved in the union specifically to help black workers. Remember you told me that? Why was that so important to you? I had promised God what I, some of the things I'd do if he would get me back home from the war. I went through a bit of bombardment one, one day, and I prayed so hard that I could hardly get God out of my mouth. And the next day, I was praying, thanking God for getting... And I, 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 I told God, I said, if you get me back home, there are certain things I'd do. I did those things. I kept those promises. And I'm in Frankfurt for well, one of the things I promised God. And I, when, I, when, when Hank Johnson uh, decided that we're going to put on a more black organizer, Walter Michael turned it down, Stanley Cotton, Cotton turned it down, and a fellow named Dogan turned it down, and they, when they got to me, I accepted because I didn't have any family at that time. 
And I said, well, I'll stay here until I can do, until they get rid of me or I'm not make good and I'll go on to Kentucky. I didn't think I would make good at it, see. But my mother had taught me a whole lot about working with people, especially Southerners. Now, <coughs> you mentioned him a little earlier, but tell me what you thought, what were your impressions of Phil Murray? I don't think you could beat him. He was one of the finest men I ever met. You, I, have to tell, you have to say his name, because my question is not, can you tell me that again, but say Phil Murray's name? I think Philip Murray was one of the finest men God ever put breath into. And I heard him say one time that sold me a, the union of a, oh, 100% and better. He said, before I would discriminate against a Negro worker, I would resign my position as president of the United Steel Workers of America. That was good enough for me. And uh, I proved it because everybody would say, oh, that George Kimberley, he's crazy about that union. He just, he just loved that union so much because the union was a vehicle, see? I had been lied on, spied on, fit on, double-crossed, tricked, betrayed, and misused so much, and here was an opportunity, see? And I, I could see it. I had the vision to see and know, believe what the union could do, and it did it. I'm not a bit disappointed in the steel workers union. Perfect. Okay. We have to change again, but this is great. <laughs> <laughs> this is great. Okay, you can go. When Roosevelt came in as elected, uh, everybody was happy because he had a program. He had an agenda for the people, and he was not anti-labor. Uh, the unions endorsed him, and of course, everybody was waiting for somebody to, to try to deliver us from the depression. It was a pretty deep depression. Of course, it, I lived all right. I got along all right in the, during the depression. I worked, because uh, I'd been taking all the extra work that they, they would have for uh, the workers that did my department. And a lot of guys had turned that extra work down. Uh, the, the, the job was to keep the metal hot, keep it from freezing. And that was my job on weekends. Nobody else wanted it, see. And when times got bad, I still got that extra work. And I fed a whole lot of people during that depression. Okay. But Roosevelt was a god sent man. People believed in him. He gave him jobs, and that was the important thing. Now, the Steel Workers Organizing Committee supported Roosevelt in '36, right? I mean, they helped get people out to vote and so forth. Why was it important for you all to support Roosevelt? Why was it important? Well, we felt like we had a friend in the White House. Hoover was no friend of working people. And but Roosevelt was a, our friend. And the result is that people everywhere supported him. It was just that simple. He didn't have to have a whole lot of things that he was doing, but the things that, the, that people needed, it improved the uh, welfare department and, and it gave people work, the young, younger generations got jobs. I, I can't name the different organizations that he had set up. Uh, for the college students, they had special work for them. And well, uh, the, the ABC's of agenda it was. Okay. Now, in addition to supporting Roosevelt, the Steel Workers Organizing Committee also supported local candidates, you know, sheriffs, judges, that kind of a thing. Why'd you do that? Why was that important? Well, I tell you what, we had, uh, I kind of can't get to remember the dates too well. But when we got a subject to director by the name of uh, Kincaid, Orville J. Kincaid, he was a powerful politician, as well as a labor leader. And uh, one of the big problems that the steel workers 
had was that getting to the polls in time to vote, where we'd have our cars all lined up as soon as they got off, the steel workers would get off from work, the cars would pick them up and take them to the polls. And let me tell you, that put a lot of fear in politicians. And when we, when the, when, when the Fair Employment Practice Ordinance came up in Gary Council, two or three of the councilmen didn't want to go along with it. And Ken Kate said, we'll meet you at the gate. Well, they knew what they meant by that. Okay. Um, now, the Memorial Day Massacre. You remember that? The what? The Memorial Day Massacre. Yes, I worked that night. Tell me what you know about that. Tell me your story about All that. I know is about what Wait I read. Wait a minute. Now tell me. And what, what I know about the, uh, that uh, was from my friends that were there. Uh, Jesse Reese and his wife and Will Young. And uh, I knew Lee Tisdale that got killed. He was on one of our uh, volunteer organizing committees. And uh, Joe Cook and several other names that just don't come to me readily were there. They told me that story. And I have that written story that I'll give to you before you leave. Now, how did you feel when you, felt, when you, when you heard about what happened? Oh, I was hurt very much. I was hurt. But, you know, I'd been where the soldiers had been killed. And they, I could take it very well, you know. Because I've seen people killed and shot up and cut up and, and torn to pieces, and I just hardened to it, you know. Now, what kind of effect did the Memorial Day Massacre have on the organizing effort? It, it, it stepped it up. You have to tell me the massacre stepped up. Listen, it didn't slow us down at all. Mr. Kimley, I need for you to tell me that the massacre stepped up the organizing effort, not just say it, okay? Because my questions won't be on. So if you could tell me the massacre stepped up the organizing effort and well, then go ahead and finish telling me the story. Wait a minute. Now. Well, uh, I just can't understand anything other than the fact that it didn't stop organizing. That was determination. We had already held our hands up to organize if it took our lives. And I didn't mind dying. I wasn't afraid of dying. And as many other workers were not afraid of dying. Uh, we knew that there were great gains to be made with the union. Very sensible people about knowing they, about the union. They, they, they didn't go in this earth blindly. Now, do you remember the La Follette Committee investigations when they came and investigated the massacre? When well, the government I, came and investigated? I don't know about that. That okay. was in East Chicago and Chicago. Okay. Do you remember when U.S. Steel signed with the steel workers without a strike? You remember that? When, yeah. You remember when U.S. Steel signed Myron Taylor and John L. Lewis? Remember when they recognized the union? Without a strike? Yes, uh, they did. Uh, they recognized it. Okay. You then gave us an increase in wages. Okay, what can you tell me about that? Do you remember that day? Do you remember what happened? Do you remember how you found out that they had signed? Well, uh, it just the word got out, you know, and, and it was reported, and we were happy over it. Do you remember the nationwide sit-down strikes? When, when the auto industry and a lot of people were sitting down? Oh, yes, in the auto workers, yes. Tell me what you remember about that. Well, I'll tell you what, I, I don't remember much more than the fact that they sat down. And it just bolstered the, 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 the steel workers. It made it a stronger union. People, they figured that the union is working. The CIO is working. Um... Tom Girdler. You remember Tom Girdler from Republic Steel? Yes, uh, Tom. Girdler, G-I-R-D-L-E-R, Girdler. Yes, her name is, I don't remember too much about him now. Okay. Now, the little steel companies, Republic Steel, Inland Steel, and whatnot, you remember when they lost their strike when they all when they when they all went back to work in 1937 without winning the strike. 
You remember that? Yes. Tell me what you thought about that and how that affected the organization. Well, we were gleeful minute, over it. We, we were happy over it. You were happy that they yes, lost? Yes, yes. We were winning. And that both of the steel workers. Okay. Let me ask you one more question here. When you think back about the union and what you did, what is it that you're most proud of? What makes you proud? That we won. That we won. That we won. That the union had actually done a job for not only steel workers, but for, but for the citizens of Gary, Indiana, and Northwest uh, Indiana, and the Calumet region also. Because there were about six di districts in the steel, District 31, and they all were prospering. Let's stop for a second. Let's stop. Okay. And one of the reasons I took the job as a, as a staff man is I knew that there was an opportunity to help my people get out of the hole they were in. I made these promises to God and I want to keep them. Since it was turned down by Walter Michael Thomas, uh, uh, Dogan and uh, uh, Stanley Cotton and maybe one other turned the job down because they had families and they asked me to take it and I took it. And I was treated very well when I went in. My first subdistrict director uh, was the name of Frank Grider from Arkansas. Well, I didn't go in that bit up towards Frank because was from the South. I sit down and talk with him. He liked it. Didn't he? And he had, when he had problems, he'd come lay on my shoulder. I never had a man to cry on my shoulder in my life. He did. He had my, I said, listen, who, listen, what are you crying about? You got everything. Just, he, he's your race, ain't you? He's white like you, ain't you? Are you letting him take advantage of you? And it's, he booked up. <laughs> the reason I think I made good on a job is because I fit in where Others didn't have the experience that I had. I fit right in, slot right in. Everywhere I'd go work on the one, I'd, I'd do things that they didn't know anything about. Because I had experience it coming up in the war and not had the experience in organizing people in Gary prior to the Union. I'd had some beautiful experiences organizing. And the result is that uh, I didn't go around telling everybody everything that was happening. I was engaged in, and they liked it. And one one commitment, one commitment said to me one time when I contacted, I said, "How in the hell do you think I won't get these black boys in the union, and you won't give, give them better jobs, upgrade them?" Yeah. Mr. Kimberley, I'll do that. I'm yeah. I, I, I'm gonna get some jobs for some of them, and I <laughs> I tipped some of them off in the department. Mm -hmm. I said, "Now listen." There are going to be some openings down in your, plot, your department. Keep your eye open and you can move up. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And these bookers went right straight back to the company and uh, to the grievance commitment. Said, Mr. Kimler says they're going to open up some new jobs for black work, steel workers. Uh -huh. And the guy came back to me, Kim, I thought I told you not to say anything. <laughs> I said, Well, you know how it is. We like to tip our friends off. Yeah. Okay, now we, gotta, we, we, we just ran out of film. Okay, now you... There were many hazardous jobs in the steel mill. You had gas of all kinds and acids and metal, hot metal and cold metal, and uh, there were different kinds of machinery that, were, that required a lot of hard uh, labor to operate. And uh, there were many casualties in the mills. Uh, steel mill... Workers, there were many steel mill workers that got killed. And I had one of my friends uh, died here recently from the injuries that he got when he worked in the mill. He was, a, a whole sheet of iron fell on him from a crane and crippled him for life. Now that was one personal uh, friend that I had that I know uh, that was hurt in the mill. There were others lost legs. I knew a fellow that fell in one of those 
and that after that, and uh, you'd be surprised to know the casualties that go on in a steel mill. And that was every need in the world for a union uh, to protect the workers from uh, all these hazardous conditions. And I think that uh, if there's anything that topped it off, it's when we had the Republic deal massacre. Uh, the workers knew what was going on, and they knew that Little Steel wasn't, wouldn't sign, and they were trying to help Little Steel to come on in and do like the, the, the other steel workers had done and to sign their union up. And they were having a picnic out there, and all at once those Chicago police opened up their guns on them and killed three or four of our people and injured a lot of them. And I have the story written up here, and I'm going to let you, let you take it with you. But you, you, you didn't tell me yet about how important it was to move on past those bad working conditions. You, before you told me that once you got a taste of freedom, once you got a taste of, of, of basic rights, you know, in the workplace, that you didn't want to go back. So can you tell me that again? Yes. Uh, I think that that was a normal idea with any human being. That after you got a little freedom in your blood, it, it's going to stay there. There's something about freedom is, that is godly. A man to be free. And all down through our life, we contact with people that were fighting for freedom. You heard uh, all these, some of them were saying, free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, we are free at last. Well, it's the same thing with the steel mill. Listen, there's slavery in the steel mill there. People died in the steel mill. And, pe and people died trying to have a union. You know the story in, in the early days of the organization of steel workers. It was brutal. Good. Now, I want to go back to um, uh, the amalgamated versus the CIO, okay? And why the amalgamated didn't work and why, the, why you switched over to the CIO and how the CIO worked? Well, I didn't know too much about the amalgamated because I got there a, a year later, and nobody talked to me very much about the strike other than I had some friends that, that got good jobs. So I knew them personally. Uh, some were electricians and some were in, uh, had other uh, jobs, the mechanics and uh, uh, crane men. There was a number of black crane men when I arrived in the steel mills. And uh, you, you had that to go on, see. And when these workers were, began to hear a uh, talk about freedom, that everybody was going to be treated alike, that if you were entitled to advance in the union or on a job, for, on the ability to do a job with seniority, you'd get it. I fell for it just like that when I heard it. You didn't have to sell it to me. When man began to talk about uh, being free to, to be move up uh, like any other steel worker, I jumped for it. I believed it. And when I heard Phil Murray speak, I was tickled to death to, to hear a man, and you could just feel it in his voice that he meant it. And in February, the, it was in February 19 and 37 that we had a conference of all Negro organizations in Pittsburgh. And it was there when I got up rose with all the steel workers that were in that meeting held their hands up and swore to die to see that the steel, black steel workers would be organized 100% in the steel workers union. And I was one of them. Now, um, you remember John L. Lewis? What can you tell me about John L. Lewis? What did you think oh, of him? Oh, he was... Wait a minute. Now tell me. You have to say his name, too, okay? Well, John L. Lewis was was come right along the line uh, with uh, Phil Murray. They worked together. I didn't know a whole lot about him, but uh, he boasted the steel workers, uh, steel, steel workers organized committee by donating money to help to organize. So there might have been a whole lot of politics in there somewhere, but I didn't keep up with it, see. 
but uh, I was very well satisfied that that John L. Lewis uh, was honest enough for me to follow, and I'd been in meetings with him. The first meeting that uh, I was with, in with him was a Wage and Policy Committee meeting in Pittsburgh, and I, that's when I heard John L. Lewis talk. I liked his voice, and I liked the way he presented himself. Now, do you remember when the Wagner Act was passed? Yes. Tell me about the Wagner Act, how well, you felt about it. I can't recall just what happened when the Wagner Act, see. In fact, I forgot just, just its provisions. Okay. But uh, we were doing all right, and as long as we were getting along all right, we were waiting for orders to do the next best thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's stop for a second. How much we got? Three and a half minutes. Three and a half minutes. Andrea. Tell me what you're telling me again. Uh, political Action <clears throat> Committee was one of the vehicles that was important in the life of our union. We knew that the, there must be laws put on a book protecting our, our union. And it wasn't very easy it, 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 to get the steel workers to understand that they must be active in the union. We vote for our friends and they vote against our enemies. And the result is that uh, we had no problem uh, raising money uh, for PAC. And uh, when our leaders came in, uh, mass meetings, and talked about who the friends were and what they were doing, we followed them. It's just that simple. We didn't have to go through a lot of explanation, explaining a whole lot of things. Only a few skeptics had to know about that. See. When you think back on it all now, when you think back on it all, uh, what makes you most proud? What do you think that it should all be, people should remember about it? The one thing, the one most single thing that people should remember about it? Well, it's so much that people should remember how the people sacrifice themselves and their homes trying to fight for this new economic freedom. It wasn't easy. Uh, people suffered and they died. They were, they were hurt. And uh, they, many men and their wives separated about it. But it was done. Now, if there's anything that I was very much impressed about the union was the fact that when I was organizing in East Chicago, Indiana, uh, there was a fellow came up to me and wanted to go around. He said, Mr. Kimberly, I'd like to go around with you sometimes. I don't want to call his name because he's got his friends. So he started going around with me, and I would teach him everything I knew about organizing. And uh, one of the comments told me, Kimberly, do you know that that well, guy is an ex-Klansman? And when I was being branded as a Klansman, as, as a communist, it was he that would come out strong in support of me. Uh-uh, not George Kimberly. He's a religious man. That man believes in God. Well, the thing that happened that I love mostly, a foreign fella invited me to come over to his house to talk to him about the union. And I took this fellow, white fellow, with me. I said, now, the best way to talk about the union is to talk what you know and experience. And when I got over there, he, the man's wife and little kid, about three years, four years old, was a, and uh, after I got through talking, Mike well, McKenzie started talking about the union. And this kid came up and climbed up in my lap and went to sleep in my arms. And the man of the house looked at that kid. That kid was really sleeping, see? And from then on, things changed for me. Looked like stock went up. See, these people had some superstitious idea of like some religious idea or something. There was some sort of sign that he got out of, something he got out of his kid climbing up in my lap and going to sleep that he loved. He told everybody in town about it. Now, another thing that, that helped me a lot that I knew, I knew that every white worker that I talked with, I would try to impress him deeply about what we were talking about because I know he was going to go back and tell it. Okay. And... Uh, 
And that helped me along. I never had any great problems. The only problem I ever had, the biggest problem I ever had, was some of my own people didn't like it because I wouldn't tell them what I was doing. Now, you take a southern white man, he, if he liked you, he'd take, just like El Orville J. Kincaid. Orville, if he liked you, he'd take his shirt off and give it to you. Mm-hmm. And if he didn't, he'd put a rope around your neck and hang you. Now, that, was, <laughs> didn't, that wouldn't go for black, that went for everybody. Yeah. He didn't care about educated people. Because yeah. he had been embarrassed in one or two black organizations. Yeah. He says, now, I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to get everything the union asks us to do for the black citizen. We're going to do it. Okay. Now, aside from getting uh, the Fair Employment Practice Committee ordinance through, he, when he was put on a, a school, uh, on, a, on a library board as the chairman, he says, well, listen, I want a, a black woman on my committee. I want a black woman on my committee. Find me one. 